you. Good afternoon, everyone. As well as being a lecturer at the medical school, I'm also part of the um, Wellcome Trust funded biomedical informatics hub uh, here at the University of Exeter. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you about some of my um, research work um, from the whole group, in fact, not just my work, and try and tell you about how we're using data to um, identify some of the causes of diseases and, and traits. So we know that genetics are really important in most, um, most medical conditions um, from the single gene disorders that many people will think of as pure genetics, things like cystic fibrosis, which are entirely genetic caused, down to things like infections, which have very, uh, a very minor genetic contribution. But the things in the middle um, are the things like diabetes and heart disease, which are the real big burdens on the, on the healthcare uh, budget. And these have a mixture of genetic and environmental components. So how do we know about this mixture? How do we calculate what percentage is uh, down to genetics? Well, probably the most powerful way to do that is using twin studies. And if you compare identical twins and non-identical twins with respect to different traits um, and conditions, you can get an estimate of the heritability or the genetic component for those traits or, or conditions. So I think this, this, this diagram here really clearly illustrates if you take dizygous twins, so these are non-identical, they only share 50% of their genes, they're, like, they're, they're equivalent to siblings. You can see very significant differences in height, weight, hair colour and so on. Whereas if you took a series of identical twins who are, for all intents and purposes, genetically identical, they'll be very similar for height and weight and body shape and so on. And you can do similar things when you take twin pairs that have various conditions and look at the co concordance between the uh, identical and non-identical twins and calculate the percentage genetic component for these traits. Now, what do we mean by, by um, the genetic component? Well, we're gonna, I'm going to talk quite a, little, quite a bit about uh, the DNA level and down to the actual DNA sequence. So... Um, just to remind people what we're talking about here. So this just shows you uh, the double helix of DNA, which is made up of these um, base pairs or, or nucleotides. And these are the A's, C's, G's and T's that, that make up the, the DNA double <coughs> helix. And the, this uh, um, DNA forms the basis of our genes, our heritable components, but these are wound uh, many times um, on themselves, on proteins, and then coiled further into the chromosomes that are present within each cell. So this slide just shows you a few facts about the genome, really. So there are 6 billion of those nucleotides, the fundamental um, coding unit of the, of the gene, if you like. There are 6 billion of those um, that constitute your genome, separated into 24 different chromosomes. And so every cell would contain those 6 billion bases. But there are actually only about 20 to 25,000 genes. When I first um, came into the field of genetics, back in the 90s, we thought there were 50,000 genes. So the number has decreased um, quite dramatically in recent times, and this is was the, only, the true number was really only arrived at when the entire human genome was sequenced um, in 2003. And we know that humans differ from each other in the, in the sequence of their, their DNA. At about uh, one in every 500 bases, two individual humans will be different. However, to, to put that into perspective, we're actually still 98% identical to chimpanzees. So we're different from each other, but we're not that different from chimpanzees either. So the first type of study that I'm going to talk about is what we call genome-wide association studies. And these are studies that utilize those very small differences in the DNA between individuals. So if we go back to the, the DNA sequence here, this is the same region of DNA in two, uh, on two different chromosomes. And you'll see um, at about every 100 to 300 bases, there'll be a, a, a base change here. So this chromosome has a CG pair here. This one has a TA pair. And these are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. And these SNPs occur throughout the genome, uh, within genes, in between genes. This is not really to scale. There's much more DNA between genes uh, than is shown in this diagram. So there are a lot more SNPs, actually, between genes as well. And there are about 10 million of these within the genome. Uh, and it's by far the most common type of variation in the genome. And so how do we use these to, um, to map diseases and to find disease genes? So what you can do is to um, type individuals for this base change in the DNA. And then compare the frequency of these two different types of 
uh, of base, either in a case control study, so you might have individuals with diabetes here would form your cases and controls, and you take what, uh, a SNP, and in this particular case, this SNP, about a similar frequency of that base change is present in cases and controls, but for this SNP, you have an enrichment in the cases. So this is telling you that you might have a disease for diabetes, perhaps, within this region of the genome. You can use it for quantitative traits too, so for things like um, cholesterol levels, and you can look at um, the percentage of each different type of, um, of base change according to level of cholesterol. And so then all this comes down to is the statistical test, really, and you just compare the frequency here, and is that statistically significantly different? And before 2007, um, the method of using this association analysis was to think of a gene that might be important in your disease, say for diabetes. You might think a gene involved in making cells in the pancreas would be important. So you'd have a look at that gene and you'd look at the, um, the, the SNPs, the, the, the base changes in that gene, and you'd say, is it associated with diabetes? And this seemed like a good idea, but the problem with it was, um, was that there are lots of reports of significant associations. Most of them were not replicated. And, of course, if you didn't find something in your first gene, you had another 24,999 to look at. But in 2007, there was a, a massive change in the technology. And we were able to look at um, large numbers of, SNP, uh, of these SNPs in a single experiment using these gene chips. So this shows you what a chip looks like compared to a matchstick, so it's a small chip, and you might have half a million um, of these SNPs that you can interrogate using this grid system here um, on a single chip. And this completely re revolutionized the field uh, of complex trait genetics. So these, these, genet these diseases and traits that have a mixture of ge genetics and uh, environmental components are called complex traits. And so now we can look at the entire genome in one experiment. So each of these dots is a, is a SNP over the whole genome. Of course, the problem then, of course, that you've got is that you've got um, a, a massive problem with multiple testing. So whereas before, if you were looking at a single variant, your, your statistical test means that you're looking at a, a, a p-value of less than 0.05. Now you're doing perhaps a million tests in this experiment. You have to correct that p-value for... Um, for, for doing that number of tests. And so what we, what we do is use a, a Bonferroni correction, and so we divide the 0.05 p-value by a million, and so a significant p-value for an experiment like this would be 5 times 10 to the minus 8. And so here is the results of, um, uh, of, of uh, an experiment here for um, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and what you're seeing here is each of the dots, you may not be able to see them as dots, but all of this grey and, and the colours are dots. They're individual SNPs and they're lined across the genome. So this is chromosome 1, 2, 3 and so on down to the X and Y chromosome down here. And they're plotted against the p-value and it's on a minus log scale. So the higher up the, the point is, the lower the p-value. So the more significant associations will be up here. We call this a, a Manhattan plot. So all the skyscrapers are the things you're interested in really. And you can see everything that comes above the threshold of 5 times 10 to the minus 8 is coloured, is coloured and everything else is in grey. And from doing an experiment like this, we can now know that there are 40 different genes across the genome that are associated with type 2 diabetes. I just mentioned to be able to do this, we needed 8,000 cases, 40,000 controls and a huge replication sample. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, why that's important. One of the other traits that we're particularly interested in in our group is um, the variation in human height. And this is one of the first uh, well-described um, sort of um, complex traits, really. And it was over 100 years ago that um, Galton and Fisher uh, predicted that human height would be um, a component of multiple genes of small effect. And this has actually turned out to be true, but we've only actually started to find those genes for the first time in, in the last... Um, few years, five years or so. And this plot just shows you um, an illustration of how sample size ha has, um, ha has contributed to that. So this is what we call a QQ plot. And what we're doing here is plotting um, the um, expected p-value that you would have by do, uh, as a result of doing the number of tests that we're doing, and that's along the x-axis against the observed p-value that we're seeing in our experiments. And you can see... Um, uh, the line here, which is a, a grey line here, 
um, is, is what you'd expect if there was no um, deviation from what we are expecting. Is that clear? And then the, the shaded grey is the 95% confidence interval around that. So if any of the, and each of the dots is a SNP, so if any of the p-values come above this line, they're, they're significantly lower than you'd expect by chance. And you can see when we did this for height and we had about 2,000 individuals, there was nothing that was coming up uh, uh, that deviated from the, the expected uh, by chance. So you're getting lots of p-values um, less than 0.05, but um, you would expect that because of the number of tests that you're doing. As you increase the number to nearer 5,000, you're starting to see a couple of things pop up. Again, to more than 6,000, you're getting significant deviation. And then when you're up to more than 40, up to nearly 14,000, you've got many, many SNPs that are, are deviating significantly. And this has been one of the major things that we've found is that sample size is absolutely crucial. Uh, and we're now up to sort of half a million um, individuals in each of these association experiments. And so for height, what we found was um, our group published the first gene associated with human height. So this is 100 years after it was predicted that they would exist. Uh, and that was this gene here, um, HMGA2, uh, in the first 5,000 individuals. And then in 2008, another two genes were described. Later on that year, 44 genes by increasing the sample size to sort of about 20,000. A couple of years ago now, um, we did a, an experiment which included 185,000 individuals and found 180 different genes associated with human height. And the current analysis, which is up to half a million individuals, we've got, I think, about 350 genes associated with human height. So the prediction is definitely true. There are multiple genes, a huge number of genes. Some are, people are even saying it's most of the genes in the genome contribute to some small effect uh, in determining uh, adult height. Um, but the important thing is, e individually, each gene only has a very small effect, which is why it's very hard to find them in small sample sizes and certainly in the sort of candidate gene studies I talked about at the beginning. And that's sort of illustrated in this diagram here. So what you find is, this is the number of genes that will increase your height and going from if you have 15 to more than 30 uh, and plotting what your height will be, um, the difference... Um, in height compared to the mean here, which is at zero. So you can see if you have uh, less than 15 height increasing genes, you're about three centimeters shorter than the mean. If you have more than 30, you're about three centimeters taller. And it's, it's, uh, it gives you that, this, um, this nice normal distribution that was predicted. Um, and the similar experiments have been conducted for multiple traits now. There have been nearly 2,000 publications. This is from the latest um, um, browser for the uh, latest catalogue of these association studies and each of these dots is a significant association across the genome. So it's been a hugely successful um, experiment really. Um, secondly I want to talk about another um, element of the, the work that we're doing and this is rather than looking at um, so remember the, the SNPs that I was talking about are occurring every few hundred bases along the, the genome but we're also now narrowing down to look at each individual base by doing a genome sequencing project. And of course the genome was um, sequenced into, the entire human genome was sequenced in 2003, but that was a mixture of individuals. The first complete individual genome was sequenced in 2007. Um, and then later on that year, another whole individual genome, um, James Watson, who discovered the structure of DNA, was sequenced the same year. Um, and this took two months to complete, cost £2 million, compared to the £3 billion 10-year project of the Human Genome Project. So what I'm saying is that the cost has dramatically reduced and the speed. So this is now becoming much more um, feasible for doing in individuals. And so since um, probably only in the last two, two years, really, it's become feasible for ordinary um, labs to do this. And many of you may have seen this report on Spotlight last night or perhaps in the national press. Um, and this is an example of some work that we've done in our group um, to find a mutation um, in this individual who's a Paralympic cyclist who has a very rare condition which we assumed was genetic, but for 10 years now um, we didn't know what the genetic cause was. Um, and this work was published uh, at the beginning of this week in Nature Genetics, so this is a reference to the paper, and we found that he had a deletion um, in this gene, POLD1. 
So he has um, very severe uh, lack of um, subcutaneous fat and diabetes, deafness, uh, uh, quite a selection of, of conditions. And um, the way that we found this genetic mutation was he, um, he was um, interesting because although we suspected a genetic cause, both of his parents were unaffected with this condition. Um, and we know that um, uh, an individual will inherit 50% of their genes from their mum, 50% from their dad. But in that process, um, there will be some changes in the bases. And on average, there are about 74 new mutations that occur uh, during that process in, in everybody, every one of us here. And uh, on average, about one of those will occur in the protein coding genes. So um, for most of us, that will be inconsequential. But for some people, if that, that change is in a very crucial part of a particular protein, uh, then that can have a very serious effect, as it was in the, the cyclist that I just showed you. And so we use this technique um, to compare the genome of um, the cyclist with his parents, and we also had another case from India who had very similar features to him. And this shows you the sequencing output from that first patient, um, and what, um, what this, uh, just to take you through it, at the top this is the reference sequence, so this is uh, the sequence that's publicly available, and each of these bars represents um, part of the sequencing information that we generated on this individual, and we use sequence short multiple um, reads of sequence when you're doing these experiments and then you line them up against the reference and you'll see that for multiple reads there's a little gap just here in this individual approximately half of the reads have a gap here and that's because on one of his chromosomes at this gene he has a small deletion an identical deletion was found in the other patient who had identical well, identical very similar features and then this is his unaffected mother uh, and she has solid reads over that region, you can't see any of those gaps, and his father the same. So this is, was a de novo mutation in this individual, um, which we've now found in four independent patients. So this is uh, very much the cause of the um, condition in this case. So that was very helpful in that for that particular individual, but what about all the other um, diseases and conditions that we're looking at? What, why, why is it important to find the genes involved, really? And I think... Um, one of the things, uh, particularly perhaps for the diabetes uh, examples, we've been working a lot on that, is it tells you a lot about the biology of these conditions. So for the diabetes case, we found that there are genes that are involved in determining appetite and BMI, which we knew that was an important part of diabetes, but was that purely environmental? It turns out not, that we found the first gene involved in um, uh, determining um, obesity uh, from doing these studies. Uh, but also there are a number of other genes involved in uh, the, the cells that make the pancreas. So that's the first offshoot, I suppose. But further down the line, we're hoping that we'll be able to personalise treatments, perhaps for individuals, by looking at the genetic burdens that individuals have. It was hoped early on that um, genetic studies such as this would really help for be helpful for predicting who would develop conditions such as diabetes and who would not. I think this has not been as successful as the, the gene finding experiments alone, and this shows you a predictive model with the gene variants um, using a receiver operator characteristic area under the curve, and I won't go into all the details of it, but really you're looking for a value of about 0.85 to give you some sort of clinically useful prediction. The gene variants alone only give you a, a 0.6 area under the curve. If you add in BMI, age and gender, that goes up to 0.8. Um, and in fact, if you take out the genes, you still get a, a, an area under the curve of 0.78. So the genes are not adding much to this predictive model. But, you know, perhaps when we find more of the genes involved, this will be um, important. I should add that we know that the genes we found so far actually only explain a small proportion of the, the genetic component, perhaps only as much as 10%. So we know there are more to find. And the costs of doing this, these sequencing experiments are dramatically falling, and this show, shows you the cost of doing it. And um, there's a lot of discussion about what people would do if a, if a whole... At the moment, I think a whole genome costs about five to $10,000, and sort of the magic number seems to be the, the $1,000 genome. And people like Francis Collins, who heads up the, the U.S. genome sequencing um, efforts was asked what, what he would do if he had, if, if he had the um, availability of the 
dollar genome, and he would said he said he would sequence 100,000 individuals with various um, conditions, and also um, 25,000 who had um, who made it to 100 um, and were healthy. So these are the sorts of experiments that people are envisaging when the costs drop even further. And in fact, last year, um, the UK government announced that they would be sequencing 100,000 patients from the UK who had, this is whole genome sequencing, it's going to cost £100 million, and they were going to sequence these patients with cancer and rare diseases. So this is um, uh, data that's, of, that's going to become available, and I think as sort of reiterate what other people have said, um, the, one of the issues is going to be how we interpret that data, how we handle it, and, uh, and what we do with uh, things that we find that we weren't expecting. Thank you.